Hi, this is Eric at Frog Valley Tropical Fruit Farm, and this is Florida Natural Farming. This will be my monthly farm update. And this is a video on food forest fruit tree farming, uh, regenerative natural farming. And I'm gonna try to go over as much of the stuff I've gone over recently and in the past about our system, um, how we combine multiple different uh, natural farming techniques like Korean natural farming, uh, Japanese natural farming, Indian zero budget natural farming, along with permaculture, centropic agroforestry, and uh, biodynamic farming. And we used to be biodynamic certified and organic certified. And I've been on this journey here with my partner for eight years and everything you see we planted except for the orchard floor uh, is an all natural uh, occurrence um, that uh, puts carbon in the soil and carbon in the soil is the hardest thing to keep on Florida sand and the easiest way to do that is with living roots so a lot of people use mulch looking at our bananas this ginger so we don't water anything so a lot of people use mulch and um, <clears throat> and uh, install trees. Our only install are our tropical fruit trees and the plants I plant, like the ginger. All the rest of it is placed there by nature. And I think that's a really important uh, part of the our farm system. And we do incorporate aspects of permaculture and centropic agriculture, just that we use the, the trees that uh, nature puts here like this locust tree, nitrogen fixing tree. And I, I, I chop them and I cro uh, crop them, um, but I don't plant uh, trees other than fruit trees in my system, unless it's some ornamental tree, but I can't think of any offhand. So along the driveway and along 12th Street, uh, I planted rows of sugar apples. So. There are green, chewy sugar apples on the left. On the right are uh, red uh, Kampong moth sugar apples. And then we have the, the living uh, mulch, the orchard floor that, uh, that nature put there. And with the living orchard floor, you're able to see how well your plants are gonna do. Uh, if you have the orchard floor covered, covered in in mulch, then you're not gonna really be able to tell what is going on with the plants just by looking at your fruit tree. Cause it could be a problem with the fruit tree that was purchased at the nurture, nursery or uh, an input you've used. <clears throat> and when you have the whole orchard floor covered in mulch, we used to put mulch down. Um, I believe in mulch just in moderation. I believe in the living orchard floor more. And so <clears throat> along with this living orchard floor, we have the sugar apples, the ginger, the mangoes. And at every sugar apple, I have uh, a cha-cha seedlings I've planted. <clears throat> so when you have a, a mulch that you've put down over the, the orchard floor, uh, generally in Florida, everything is highly compacted because it's been mowed or driven over. And so the sand is basically like a sandbag and water can't move through it. So then when you add mulch on top of it, it's very hard for roots to get down. There's my little uh, achachiro seedling. We have about 500 achachiros. That's why we started this farm. It's very hard for, for roots to get down into the the deeper soil and the mulch prevents the water from moving through the soil into the soil whereas the living roots put the soil the the moisture directly into the into the root zone of your tropical fruit trees and in the root zone of these weeds 
is a plethora of biological uh, diversity of microorganisms that enable um, and promote plant growth. There's another achachiro. I gotta move along here though, so you get the idea what I planted here. So the neighbors spray glyphosate, and this particular area, the trees, one mango died. Of all my mangoes, only one died here. In I think all my mangoes I planted. One did die here, and then this tree looks haggard, but this the ginger also killed. I have a feeling that they sprayed a lot of glyphosate because they sprayed it right into our yard. It's been a few years now, but um, down here, but they did it last year in the back, and then I confronted them, and they, they have stopped. Thank God, I don't understand why these people spray glyphosate. So it's, uh, I put my day, I'm putting my daily manure with these mango trees along here. Um, so we apply inputs. So along with the orchard floor, which we let grow out and we don't disturb, so we don't walk on it, we don't compact anymore by mowing it or uh, walking on it or covering it in mulch, that we do still use mulch daily in small increments. That's what that is. That's what our daily manure is. We use it daily. Just we don't cover everything with it. It's a combination of stuff. So it's uh, I, I borrowed this uh, uh, regenerative farming technique, the uh, living orchard floor, floor from uh, Japanese natural farming. Fukuoma, whatever his name is, I forget. I'm um, sorry. Uh, here's one of our rare aeroids. So I'm into like rare tropical fruit trees. This is the Cebu blue variegated form. It's connected to the tree. I have not watered that. We haven't had rain here in four, like four weeks. It's supposed to rain today, but everything's looking good. I can't really tell uh, anything that's gone bad. So this is again, some of the trees that pop up that I, uh, I crop. I, uh, break them off uh, like they do in permaculture. I just don't try to go into my system, like walk through here, unless I'm planting seeds or trees, or uh, there's a buttercream mango that's starting to bloom, and um, or uh, harvesting fruit. That's the only time I go in there. So, or unless, you know, a tree is like completely, uh, 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 completely covering or has the chance to damage one of my fruit trees. Then I'll go in there with a chainsaw and trim it. So we have mulberries, we have rollinias, we have uh, peach tree, seed grown peach tree. All this stuff does good and it does really well without ever being watered. I do not water anything when I plant it. I don't feel we need to at this point. We, you know, have done so many biological sprays with the biodynamic horn 500 and all the biodynamic preps. And then I did the Bokashi sprays and I did black soldier fly leachate spray. And I did, you name it, I did it. I experimented and I did it for a long time until it seemed like stuff started finally being able to grow uh, without uh, my help. And what finally did it was realizing after taking a bunch of soil classes and realizing that the living root and the undisturbed uh, orchard floor and the tall grass is how you build soil. Uh, so from the, the my, mycorrhizal fungi and the root zones of the plants, the mycorrhizal fungi and the other uh, fungi are what build soil with the aid of tall grass. <clears throat> so here's our more stuff. Here's more mangoes, sugarloaf mango. There's another mango here. Here's a buttercream mango. I'm going to go look at the zebus real quick because uh, our fertility program is basically the miniature zebus. Uh, here's a white sapote. Here's a mango tree, a naturally farmed mango tree. Um, here's one of those trees that I crop, like in Centropic Farming, that had shown up on its own. I think it's really important to have 
what grows, what nature puts there inclusive into a food forest. I really don't see how a forest can be any be a forest unless unless it's mostly nature, which is what our orchard floor is. Here's our mangoes that are showing big bloom, fruit punch mango. Uh, this we didn't plant, obviously. That's a native species, you know, uh, laurel oak. And here's our zebu barn. I haven't cleaned out for the day. But, <clears throat> so if you're not putting, um, there's Wally. Hi, Wally. They're really incredible. It's our bull. Um, if you're not allowing nature a space in uh, your food forest, I really don't see how that can be a food forest, but that's just my opinion. So that's why we allow nature a space and a front row seat, basically, in our uh, food forest, fruit farm, tropical fruit farm. And because of that, I firmly feel that it is a food forest and not an install, which I think if you put everything in and manage every aspect of it, um, it might look like a forest, but forests aren't installed by humans. Forests grow naturally. That's just how I feel. So this is a Kwai Mok tree and this Kwai Mok tree is produced fruit. We have two different types of fruit in Kwai Mok. And I have noticed that the Kwai Mok, this is a grafted tree from Excalibur. That's one of our daily uh, manure inputs. It's hay, a little urine, and about 20 pounds of zebu manure. And I apply it every day year round. So we do believe in mulch and I have used wood chips in the past. We had a tractor that I, I mulched and did around the trees. But I found that if I remove uh, the roots from around trees that are freshly planted, this is a peach cobbler mango, that's a pineapple pleasure mango. This is a uh, Venus mango that has a lot of bloom on it. And it's got a passion vine on here. This is a fruit punch mango that's also blooming. Um, and this is a, a sugarloaf mango that's blooming. It's awful early for mangoes to bloom. Uh, sapodilla tree. There's some other stuff in here. I'm trying to look for it. <laughs> it doesn't really bother the trees, this, this, the weeds. In fact, it kind of protects it from the sun. So I found that when I plant fruit trees in, in a dry farm system, this could took, there's a jackfruit that's got 20 fruit on it. There's a, a, a sweet tart mango. This is an ice cream beam. There's a sugar apple. I had a sugar apple here, but I accidentally broke it thinking, you know, while I was harvesting weeds for my zebu cows. Here's another raw sapote. It kind of looks haggard, but it's not, not, never fear. Uh, the, the trees survived the drought. There's another raw sapote. And um, here's the MB, male MB tree. Here's our lychees starting lychees. This is an all summer mango. This is a uh, sugar loaf mango. This is a lychee. <clears throat> so when I remove the, the weeds from around the plant, like a ring of them, like they suggest, the little seedlings would die in a dry farm system because I don't water anything when I plant it. I never have. And so I've experimented this way for 13 years. We have a, a place that we've had uh, fruit trees growing continuously for 13 years. There's a jackfruit seedling. Here's a giant cashew tree that produces so much fruit and it's never been affected by the cold. None of these trees, for the most part, are ever affected by cold temperatures, even though we're 9B, 10A border. Here's our citrus, uh, Miko lemons. There's another Ross Sapote seedling. Uh, Miko lemon, Miko lemon, that's a, a, a Valkyrie mango. <clears throat> so it took me a while to figure out that just plant the, the tree directly into this. And that way in the soil, in the root zone of your tree, after you remove the soil from around your, your root ball of your tree that you're planting, especially if it's a nursery started tree, 
<clears throat> rinse it off, get rid of the soil, rinse off the root ball, be gentle with the roots, and then put the shovel in there. Dig a hole if you have to, if it's a big root ball, but leave all this. And when you do that, the tree always survives. But when I mulched and removed the soil, the tree would die. This is why I share this information. It's not that it's the right way. It's just, um, this is our little cashew seedlings. I do see them popping up everywhere. Uh, I planted more than 200 of them this year uh, from our fruit, because we are a major source of rare tropical fruit seeds now. Uh, we only sell fresh seeds. I do not believe in selling elderly seeds. So if the seeds are more than a month old, I don't sell them. I plant them. Uh, this is a buttercream mango. <clears throat> Pigeon peas. So I'm trying to get the trees, the other fruit trees back here. This is further away from the house and I'm, it's mostly all mangoes and cow pasture and donkey pasture because we have two donkeys also. This is a diamond mango and diamond mango has produced three separate crops for us before. And I see it starting to push. The buds are starting to swell, but I don't see any flowers on it. So we had a little bit of freeze here in the past. Uh, when it was 31 degrees and it only affected a few trees like this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. But all the others survived without any frost damage whatsoever, carried the fruit. We even had cacao hold fruit and produce full-size fruit with viable seeds that I have grown the fruit out of um, at 31 degrees. So uh, it is possible, but you have to include all this for us, we have to include all this natural, uh, naturally installed diversity that nature put here. And then just add into it with our fruit trees. So these are cotton candy mangoes. This is a uh, buttercream mango. No, this is sweet tart mango. I see that it's starting to swell. This is a buttercream or a cotton candy mango. This is a buttercream mango. This, this mango tree had this uh, the fruit that uh, was on the trees starting to bloom. I see it. So it produced three crops for us and the last fruit uh, was ready in October, but the creatures got it. And so I couldn't do a video of it. I let it sit there too long. That's the problem with leaving the fruit on the trees with mangoes is the creatures will get them once they're ripe or very close to ripe once they smell them. This is a, a sweet tart mango. <clears throat> All this stuff is possible in Florida. Florida is an amazing spot and it's just highly polluted and it's highly compacted. So these are our cow pastures, one, two, three. They're in this one right now. I'm surprised they're not over here. We'll probably see them on the way back. Here's a sweet tart mango and it is definitely swelling. Uh, so all of them are gonna start blooming here because our mangoes all bloom in unison. I've never had them not bloom separately, except the second and third crops. Uh, here's a uh, buttercream mango, it's swelling. Here's a mango that froze. There's a mango that did not freeze. And then we have seedlings of cashew, cashew seedlings and uh, uh, mango seedlings uh, that we planted that are coming up here. I've also planted lots of achachiro through here and there's a jackfruit and here's a fruit punch mango and I see it's starting to swell. And there's a little mango seedling. There's the cow pasture. Here's a, a cashew seedling. So it's starting to fill in. Here's our daily manure. There's a mango right there. That's what it looks like. I tried to get a, a pile next to every tree it's mulch. I mean, that's, I mean, this is what, if you, mul if I mulch, this is what I would mulch the entire thing out with, would be hay, coastal Bermuda, you know, there, everything is dirty and polluted now. Uh, the soils that they grow organic fruit on, these are Valkyrie mangoes, that they grow our organic vegetables on are generally converted from industrial, conventionally grown farms, which have used fertilizers, which were made from biosolids. Biosolids are made from uh, sewage sludge and other industrial sources. And 
they're a known source of forever chemicals. So even though the this is a ge little gem mango, there's a daily manure I put next to it. Even though, even though the farm has been converted to organic, chances are it has never been tested for forever chemicals. And chances are they're growing that organic produce on a farm that was conventionally grown using biosolids. So it's, the forever chemicals are called forever chemicals because they last forever. They've started changing the names of them and now they're called Gen X chemicals or something like that. And, but they're just as to toxic. It's just like uh, the PBA and the PBSs and the PBFs. They didn't want PBA and uh, used in water bottles, but the PBFs that they replaced it with and the PBSs are worse, highly, more highly toxic. And they've shown that all plastics uh, excrete microplastics uh, into the water of the water bottle or the, the, the water irrigation uh, delivery system. So these are cotton candy mangoes. There's my daily manure, the cotton candy. This one froze. This one, I think, froze. That one did not, this one did not. It just was hit and miss. We had about 20 trees get froze when it was 31 degrees. But this ice cream mango did not freeze. Ice cream is also a, uh, a, uh, a uh, regeneratively farmed, naturally farmed uh, fruit tree here that uh, it's starting to swell and produces three crops a year. So it fruits three separate times a year. And now it's going to flower again for the fourth, for the fourth time this year and produce fruit early for us. This one's starting to, this is a Valencia pride. This is a Valencia pride. Um, here's a, a mango that, uh, just has always struggled. This was horse pasture back here. So it was never an industrial farm. It was never a citrus farm, but it was a horse pasture back here for 50 years and horses compact soil. And I planted a bunch of little seeds through here, but I don't see any of them popping up. It doesn't mean that they're not there. It's just that I haven't walked through there looking for them. And they're probably there. Uh, I'm gonna try to see some while I'm walking because I have seen some while I'm walking. I do see a... a a cashew right there. So there's stuff coming up in here. It's just uh, not not seen yet. I see another cashew, but it's too far away. I'm not even going to bother looking at it. And it was good to let this ground go fallow and not disturb it and not continue mowing it. Most people would continue mowing it, but when you mow, it compacts the soil and sand is so easily destroyed that you know you can't build soil on uh on uh mowed, mowed grass in florida supposedly you couldn't build soil in in uh, florida on sand but we now know that that's not true because we do it here but you have to do it with tall grass and it has to be undisturbed and you have to have the biology so I'm gonna go back over plastics again a little bit. So these organic farms, they use plastic mulch. And so they're putting plastic mulch down on uh, previous, what was probably previous, there's two cashew seedlings I see. Um, uh, previously industrially grown farm that uh, probably used biosolids. So, the plastic mulch combined with the biosolid forever chemicals, plastic mulch has a whole list of, it's a petroleum product, the polyethylene or polyethylene and polypropylene plastic mulch. Uh, there's a little mango. They're coming up, there's a pigeon pea. Stuff's coming up, um, it's good. So the plastic mulch that they put down to keep back weeds is a synthetic, um, material, which is supposed to be banned in uh, organic agriculture, but USD organic, it goes against the or USD organic farm, uh, organic farm plan. Um, but yet they put it on the soil and it, when plastic is in contact with soil, it excretes a lot of, there's one of my little hel heliconias, it excretes, or not excretes, it breaks down quickly into uh, macroparticles of plastics and microparticles of plastics. 
those plastics go into the soil and your plant uptakes them, your vegetable crops on organic farms, and you consume them. That's how you get them in your food. So um, there's bananas. I had a bunch of uh, cashews through here and I tried to find them recently and I couldn't see any of them. I think the rabbits got them. And I have a, a loquat that is just suffering, but I think the rabbits have been chewing on the bark. So there's some mangoes back here. I should have uh, looked at them a little bit. So when they're using this plastic mulch and the longer they use it, the more mic macro part micro particles of plastic. And those are uh, uh, forever chemical infused, triclosan infused, UV uh, protector infused, which are known carcinogens. Um, you name it, it's got it in there if it's toxic. And they're all synthetic. So they're going against their uh, organic farm system by uh, basically putting synthetic substances that cause cancer directly into our food. So there's a, a mango seedling. They are coming up in here. I see them. There's another one. So the arrows, I'm sure, are coming up because they all grow. And some of this stuff is just going to die. So this is my don uh, donkey pastures back here. They're on that right now. And anyway, so really the only way uh, food that I think is healthy is you have to grow it yourself. It's really a shame that we've gotten to this space in U.S. farming where um, stuff is not regeneratively grown and organic really isn't organic anymore. Uh, here's our pond. It's still fairly full. Um, so these, these people applied fill three feet above our property and it looks like it's lower than our property now. And they keep mowing it and mowing it and mowing it. And then when it rains, there's standing water. We don't have any standing water on this property. I can walk this all these trails without hitting any standing water, even after like 10 to 20 inches of rain. Not directly after, but you know, within a few hours, it's all gone. <clears throat> So the only uh, true clean food is regenerative farming, uh, natural farming, regenerative natural farming. And that's how we grow our fruit trees. And it works here in Florida. And we grow about 70 different types of fruit trees, uh, more than that, 70 different species of uh, rare tropical fruit trees. We specialize in garcinias and mangoes now we have about 250 so this is a, a juicy peach mango that had never flowered or fruited for us before and now it's flowering and i had given it some daily manure you know our zebu manure our zebu from our zebu cows and I put a path in here just so I could do that. So all these paths are new. Uh, I think you can look at my February 20th, 2023 videos and see uh, what it looked like after I mowed this undisturbed uh, grass and weeds. It was like totally aggregated and super uh, nice soil. But as soon as, you, as soon as you mow, that stops that. And then the rain beats down on it because the rain protects the sand from uh, compaction and sun and keeps the th temperature just right below ground for your trees. And it also this roots in the ground system keeps the pH perfectly constantly. So even if your water is not the right pH, which generally this is a, a, a Pickering mango. I uh, just want to see if it's swelling or anything. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, yeah, Pickering mango. I just had to double check. Um, so even though your pH of your water might be, I feel like some raindrops, uh, might be uh, too high a pH because we have so much calcium in our in our. Uh, soil because we're on limestone rock and um, most of our soils are disturbed so they're uh, calcareous soils uh, originally it was probably silica according to my soil scientist friend um, but 
everything's so highly disturbed here from Phil and and anthropogenic um, practices that it's it's mostly calcareous and here in Indian River County that's definitely what it is uh, they've been sh they've shown that and so uh, a lot of your fruit trees like uh, lower pH uh, soil so um, it uh, keeps the pH at the optimum range for your fruit tree with the biology in the soil so to add the biology in the soil uh, we I believe that the best input this is a sweet tart mango this is a uh, that's a juicy peach mango it's a pigeon pea and a and a you know a cassava this is a a, a fruit punch mango there's a, a cashew that's popping up this is a lemon zest mango so through here I planted a lot of uh, a lot of uh, our own uh, achacha iro seeds. <clears throat> I don't see any cashews, but it's so tall that it would be really hard to see them. Here's a lancetia mango. This is not my favorite mango in, in the least. In fact, I just find them horrible, to be honest with you. Uh, these are carry mangoes. Carry mangoes are okay. They produce quite a bit of crops. There's another ice cream mango. Ice cream mango is definitely an awesome mango. Um, there's a... a uh, Cogshaw mango, not one of my favorites either. I have a few that I don't really like, but we have 50 different types of uh, naturally farmed, regenerative grow, uh, farmed uh, mango trees. Oh, this carry mango is blooming. It's swelling too. So it's going to have a whole, uh, I can see it's like got flower buds starting all over it. Hopefully this rain doesn't disturb my bit. Ice cream mango, ice cream mango. And you can see I did the, the zebu manure. So the zebu manure is from the zebu cows. This is a cotton candy mangoes. Cotton candy mangoes uh, is like the ultimate input for biology. It just, I just, when I apply it, this is a, a priestly atamoya. It was covered in grapevines, which I killed off or, you know, chopped back. There's my chop and, you know, my chop or my syntropic agriculture combination with natural farming uh, it's borrowed from them um, so the zebu manure is just like it's what they used uh, in ayurvedic uh, holistic holistically uh, grown uh, indigenous cows from india the zebu cow and um, and it's the input is like as soon as I applied it, as soon as we got our zebus more than two years ago, three years ago, almost three years ago, um, there's the Valkyrie mangoes again, Valkyrie, uh, fruit punch. Um, it, stuff started blooming. So our Achachiro tree that was four years old, planted four years old, it was probably like a 10 year old tree, but I had planted it here from a pot. It's a little cashews again. The seedlings are coming up. This is like the back area. So it's like was the last and it's the least that's, um, it's a fruit punch mango. It's the least area that I go back to to plant when it's hot because there's not a lot of cover. And when it's really hot, I don't like to come back here. I like to stay up in the shade for obvious reasons. So the Ziva manure, as soon as I applied it, everything started flowering and we got a bumper crop of mangoes that year. It was just, amazing and I noticed that when I apply the zebu manure to trees that have fruit it seems like the more I can get on them I don't do it an excessive amount being biodynamic certified the original regenerative farming and probably the only safe form of food that you could buy that's uh, um, <clears throat> they're probably not even safe either now that I think of it because they were converted from industrial farms and probably have PFAS in their soil if they had used uh, industrial fertilizers, conventional fertilizers. So they contain biosolids that contain um, forever chemicals, but at least they don't use the plastic. <clears throat> so the biodynamic farm made me this is their farm standard they make you figure out how much nitrogen per acre you're applying to your soil 
So when to be certified, we're not biodynamic certified. And uh, it, uh, there's lychees and pigeon peas. It, it showed me when I figured it out, math was never one of my best subjects. There's a Miko lemon, there's a, a mango right there, and there's lychees and Miko lemon, and uh, this is a sweet tart mango. It showed me that I'm applying 29 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. So it's such a small amount. They allow you to apply 80, my biodynamic allows you to apply up to 85 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. But I found that when I apply my Zebu manure for my daily manure, if I apply two or three piles of it, which is like 60 pounds of manure, spread out, I don't do it all in one day, but I have done it um, just to see what would happen. The trees produce a lot of fruit and the trees, the mango trees that generally would drop fruit from powdery mildew actually get powdery mildew, but there's a santal tree. Oh, I had it on expanded for a while. Um, there's another santal tree. Um, what would they would the zebu that when I applied zebu manure, a zebu cow manure uh, around in large quantities on mango trees, or even not in large quantities, like one uh, pile per year, the the fruit wouldn't drop from powdery mildew, and, and they'd set huge crops of it. So. I don't believe in applying any copper. That's another thing that they do on all these farms. So this is that uh, MB tree that produced uh, so much fruit for us this year. It actually may produce enough fruit to pay our property taxes, minus $200, this one tiny little tree. It's crazy. And, but I applied a pile here and I applied two piles before it bloomed before. You have to wait five months, 120 days after applying manure before you can harvest and sell fruit to the public. So there's a cashew tree. It's just the rules. There's rules on all this uh, stuff. So here's Katuk and here's our uh, wax jambu trees and there's a pur uh, pur uh, purple hog plum, I guess. And then there's a M4 mango and there's uh, other mangoes here, uh, uh, Venus mango. They're all starting to bloom. And there's a little uh, cashew pigeon peas and there's a M4 mango and there's a a, a, a a citrus and there's a white sapote. We have a little everything here. Uh, there's our daily manure that's all cover, covered up and it's right next to our um, biggest uh, Luke's Garcinia tree that has uh, like more than four feet, four and a half feet. So we have about a hundred of those Luke's trees. They're anywhere from three inches to four and a half feet. It's bizarre. They just grew in different, different um, stages. So I do remove pepper trees. That's what that is because they turn into a maintenance nightmare. I don't even bother syntropic in them or permaculture in them. I just don't want them. Here's our uh, dragon fruit. This is a red flowered dragon fruit called Br Bruni. And then I have a seed grown uh, giant yellow uh, dragon fruit. The sweet one, the big giant one. I see it's gonna rain, decide to rain while I'm making my video. Hasn't rained in ages and here we are gonna have rain. But I'll go in the shade. So here's the Achachiro tree. There's the Achachiro tree. They're getting quite big, some of them. There's our um, Monstera Deliciosa. I have my little bull calf Romy out here in the rain. He's probably not liking this. Hopefully he's being protected by the jackfruit tree. <clears throat> There's that big Achachiro tree. It's about eight feet. Uh, then I have lots of little uh, uh, cacaos planted in here because we are going to be a major cacao, naturally farmed cacao fruit, dry farmed. Uh, in the future, it's just a matter of time. Uh, Trinitoro cacao, Trinitoro cacao, Trinitoro cacao, uh, a little cacao right there, that leaf. There's a little cacao. And then we have jackfruit uh, right there and achachiros. There's all kinds of stuff and ginger. <clears throat> I 
There's another um, hermaphrodite in bee tree that I put my daily manure next to because this tree has never held fruit to maturity and it gets covered in fruit. And I put some manure, some uh, zebu manure next to it just so I could show because I feel so firmly that this is going to finally hold the fruit after it got this input because it's definitely a nutrient <clears throat> imbalance when trees are not... Um, that are getting diseased or they're getting, they're not uh, fruiting or they're, they have issues. It's either a nutrient or it's nutrient deficiency caused by compaction. So there's another Luke's Garcinia, which all these living roots that nature puts here, nature provides here, um, uh, fixes. <clears throat> We have great big giant trees, and this is where I like to bury my biodynamic 500 horns in the ground that I dig up to make BD500. I re just rebury the horn. It's a modified biodynamic system, just like we take aspects of, it's kind of borrowed, it's kind of like a, uh, it's a, it's a combination of Korean natural farming and biodynamic 500 horns. So I don't bury it for six months, I bury it for three days and dig it up and rebury it in trouble spots where I have compaction. And it fixes stuff. The whole horn, the 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 cow horn and the the manure uh, combined. There's a a, a a another hermaphrodite MB tree with jackfruit and a mango. And this is a male MB tree. This is a Garcinia. This is a Inga spectabilis tree. <clears throat> There's my little boy, Romy. I'll come get you in a second. It's getting to be too long for this video to be made, but there he is. Hi, Romy. I'll be right there. I'm gonna cut it short. I'm just gonna finish this up. I'm gonna go this way, try to hold my hand over the camera. So we have sugar apples I wanted to do a video of all along there, fruit, but it's not gonna be able to, to uh, cause it's raining too hard and it's the camera lens is gonna get wet and this is a black sapote tree. And, but anyway, so I borrow, it's a borrowed uh, technique, part biodynamic, part Korean natural farming, where I just, um, I only bear it for three days, like they would do with the uh, indigenous microorganism capture in rice. And we're capturing fungi because it's a fungally dominant system. There's a mulberry, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Pigeon peas, little citrus, little achichiros, uh bananas, cashews, um, little seedling mangoes from this year, little seedling cashews from this year, and bananas. And then this is a citron orange. I have a bunch of citrus planted in here. We have about 12 different types, 13 different types of seed grown citrus. And <clears throat> sorry, I wasn't paying attention. So it is borrowed from Korean natural farming and it's a region. It's like a combination. This is like a combination of everyone's uh, natural farming and modified by me. Um, here's our uh, star fruit. I just did a video showing that the last video. Not a good day to do a video. Here's a cashew tree, but we need the rain, so I'm happy about that. <clears throat> Here's more star fruit that has has uh, flowers on it. So Indian natural farming, zero budget natural farming, uh, probably uh, influenced me the most because it made me look at the indigenous cows of India and, and find the miniature zebus. I didn't even know they existed. This is a pomelo tree. There's a bunch of different stuff in here. Uh, I can't see it right now. There's a star fruit. <laughs> there's a, a chempa jack. Um, there's a pomelo tree or a, a sweet orange. That's either a pomelo or a sweet orange. This is a rangapuri lime. This is the achachiro. It's getting quite large finally. Um, there's a little koi muck seedling. There's my uh, Monstera deliciosa alba, albo. Um, it's doing good. 
I collect rare aeroids like uh, Philodendron Spiritus Sancti. Here's our another uh, fruiting Quimac tree. It's a different type of uh, Quimac. This is a uh, our uh, Ingefuilii that's uh, flowering right now. There's our passion fruit, some of it. We have passion fruit popping up all over the place. Here's a delightful canistel fruit. It really is delightful. It's as good as raw sapote. It's a grafted tree. And they're getting very close to being ripe. I'm very excited to start eating those. I'm gonna do a taste test of, of them when they're done. Then we have lots of different star apples in here. We have the juicy pearl star apple. We have the Philippine gold star apple. We have Jocko Beach Star Apple. We have Vietnamese Pink Star Apple. We have the, this is the Jocko Beach. And then we have Oscar's Giant Purple Star Apple. It's like soft, softball size. Softball size fruit. This is a big Ingus Spectabilis. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna go on that trail because I'm trying to abbreviate this uh, farm tour because it's so wet. So this is our torch ginger, uh, coral colored torch ginger or pink pink torch ginger or red torch ginger. This is the uh, Monstero, Monstera, uh, Burley Marks flame. There's the Achich Iro. The little orchids everything just grows the same way without any help from us uh, and a combination of natural farming uh, techniques to grow fruit trees and rare tropical fruit fruit and this is a, a philodendron speriarum that was a philodendron um spe uh, <clears throat> uh -huh. Glorious, glorious. Um, there's some stuff in here. There's a, I'll just go in here. It seems like it's less rain underneath these trees. This is one of the tropical plants we grow. It's the uh, can't stromat. There's a, 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 a Plinia inflata, giant mulche. There's this uh, little citrus and bananas, of course. There's some other, oh, there's a, a Tulisia, Melococcus. Uh, we have two different types of Tilicias. They're like giant longans, like the Pulisan. Pulisan. I'm going to look at my uh, spirit philodendron Spiritus Sancti because there's is that um, green sapote I planted a couple weeks ago without watering it ever. Even during drought, when I planted, I showed how to do that, remove the, the soil. This is a pomelo seedling. And here's our uh, Spirit of Sancti. It got a little terrorized by the heat during the summer, but it seems to be doing good and the drought hasn't been good to it. And being out here in the wild, it's like suffering. But now that it's cooled off and it's rained, I think it's gonna pop right out of it. Uh, I, uh, purchased a variegated uh, philodendron spiritus sancti but of course it was somebody trying to rip people off Thank thankfully I got my money back that's always can be a problem I guess if it's the price is too good to be true it probably is um, here's a Garcinia intermedia and here's the my durian trees that have never been watered and Look at how healthy it is. And after four weeks without rain and didn't get watered in. This is my Pulisan tree. There's a little cacao growing there. There's a coffee tree. Uh, there's the other durian I just recently planted and it looks great. Uh, all this stuff is possible and it really is a true regenerative way to grow in Florida. Um, uh, fruit trees. Here's uh, our fruiting cacao. So this is the tree that held fruit at 31 degrees and it developed to maturity. So this is a seed grown tree from a tree that I, I planted in Brevard County 13 years ago that has produced fruit every year. 
for the last 13 years and it's being dry farmed. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still there. So I planted a bunch of uh, uh, bread nuts, the Articarpus bread nut. And I have noticed them popping up everywhere. And I was kind of surprised. Here's another Telicia tree, Floresii. There's a little cacao. I was kind of surprised to see them coming up even without any rain and they look great. Here's one that looks 10 times better than the one in, plat in the pot. So I do like to experiment to see how stuff grows in pots and compared to how stuff grows <clears throat> direct sown, the seeds. Here's a, a Monstera obliqua Peru. It's getting kind of long and, and spreading out. And here's some more of those Articarpus um, bread nuts growing next to this poor uh, Anthurium regali that got beat up by the windstorm. Philodendron maximum. Here's my uh, queen, Warraquianum Anthurium. Um, there was another one. Here's another of those bread nuts. They are coming up. Um, even without any water, that yellow is just from something else. Um, I'm just surprised. That's an ultra tropical. Ultra tropicals seem to be able to grow just fine here when you focus on biology in the soil, which is what a system like this does. And uh, anything I see as possible, even durian in Florida. Uh, here's a little keppel tree. So this is the fruit tree that you eat the fruit and it's from the Thai royalty, the only ones that used to have it from Thailand. And um, you eat the fruit and it uh, makes your bodily excrement smell like flowers, I guess. Uh, <laughs> there's the Nauclea latifolia, the African peach, doing great. There's a kumquat tree. There's a rose apple tree. It's a kumquat tree. Look at how healthy they are when they're growing in full shade. <clears throat> really nice. Uh, they fruit in full shade. Here's another achachiro tree. There's our bananas. That's a trail that I didn't take. I'm just trying to get the most of the farm in here. Here's a, a wampy tree. <clears throat> There's a citrus growing right next to it. This is the Monstera lecleriana variegata. Look at the variegation on this. This plant is incredible. Um, beautiful, huge leaves. Monstera lecleriana variegated. Uh, there's an ackee fruit tree for my friend Frank. There's a achachiro popping up. Bananas, of course. Cassava, of course. Another achachiro. And... Looks like there's a little seedling uh, soursop tree. Never seems to be affected by the cold or the or the uh, the drought. <clears throat> Nothing looks like it had drought stress to me. Nothing. Another achachiro tree. It's just we use so much water here. It's it's just um, I, it's not necessary. I, I don't believe if you focus on the orchard floor. This is a, a hybrid a Garcinia tree. It's, I think it's a cross between Garcinia brasiliensis and Garcinia gardneriana, but it is a sweet version like Garcin Garcinia gardneriana fruit. Um, here's another citrus. There's the uh, turkey mulberry. There's another achachiro tree. There's a sapodilla in there. There's bananas. I got a bunch of... Uh, Cherry of the Rio Grande's in there, the, uh, the orange and the black. And there's another Santal tree. There's a big Cherry of the Rio Grande right here. There's a mango tree. Um, there's a black sapote with fruit on it. That's a mango that actually froze. This is the world's best mulberry cutting. These are mangoes that had froze through here. This was always the worst compacted spot and I buried those biodynamic horn 500 uh, uh, naturally farmed fruit trees. 
this is I forget what this is um, but you might be able to recognize it it's got silver on the back it's a very interesting uh, plant I, it was a gift from my friend Frank there's a ingus spectabilis tree there's little mangoes uh, bigger mangoes um, this is some sort of uh, lucuma or a canis type canistel family Puteria family. I don't know what it is. It was a gift from my friend Frank, some specialty one, not the fuzzy one. This is a orange sherbet mango. This is a big um, soursop tree and I see it has flowers on it. Uh, this tree is not fruited yet, but it always gets beat up by the cold weather. This was a nursery started tree. The little seedling you saw never lost leaves, but this tree will lose leaves when it gets down to uh, 40 degrees, definitely every year. This is a, a peach cobbler mango. This is a, a, a fruit punch mango. Then I planted a bunch of different stuff in here. I can't see it on the fly, but I know that I planted uh, cashews and there's a, a achachiro. There's a, another orange sherbet mango. There's an all summer mango. There's a Miko lemon. There's a cashew right there. Um, stuff's in there, a little stuff. You just don't see it until the drought hits and after it rains. There's another Miko lemon next to a cashew or a mango and bananas. And then, you know, trees that I use for like Centropic uh, regenerative farming that I just chop, a modified version. I modify everything for my own purposes, but I like to combine all re known regenerative farm methods and modify them. I don't think that the stuff was meant to be uh, uh, dogmatized. That's why I stopped being biodynamic certified. There's a uh, citrus, a Miko lemon, bananas. Um, this is a buttercream mango and it's starting to flower. Um, there's a Miko lemon, here they are. They look great, they are good. Uh, just incredible. Uh, this is a uh, mango, of course, bananas. There's a little guavas tree there. There's a big achachiro tree, about eight feet. There's another Florigon mango. Uh, this is a seed-grown uh, black sapote. Here's black sapotes with lots of fruit on them. This is a bernicke. They're not ready yet. Maybe now that we get some rain, they'll ripen up. Um, I, I like black sapotes. Uh, black Beauty black sapote has been the, my black sapote of choice. Those are our Miko lemons. Um, this is a jackfruit. be able to get through the farm it's amazing so all along the road up there you can't see it but it's all sugar apples atamoyas elamas we have a lot of fruit on the trees and then i've planted little elama seedlings through here i'm going to try to see if i can see them i saw that the rabbit was getting one of them so i don't think i'm going to be able to find that there's one right there uh priestly atamoyas and then there's a, a guava. We have little guavas all along here. The guavas pretty much produce fruit year round. It's a seed uh, grown guava. There's another one down there. They're all along here. We have about 10 different types of guavas. There are, is some green fruit on that big guava back there. It's a huge tree. This is a big achachiro tree. It's over seven feet. And bananas, of course. I'm gonna look for more um, <clears throat> atamoyas through here. Here's an atamoya. It's getting big. I wanted all the trees along the driveway and along 12th Street to be Atamoyas, but I was buying my fruit trees and I couldn't find large quantities of Atamoyas. So I got a, some Atamoyas from Lara Farms. That's where I got my Priestly Atamoya. There's a Longan right there, a Shree's Shampoo Longan. We're finally getting Longans off some of our fruit. This is an orange sherbet mango again. And there's mangoes and mangoes. I mean, yeah, mangoes, mangoes, bananas, mangoes, and then there's little cashews in there, and there's a cinnamon, Brazilian ice cream bean, uh, cinnamonier, Inga cinnamonier. <clears throat> I go look at the sugar apples, and then we're, like, pretty much done. Can't believe I got through this. Uh, these are sugar apples. So we have chewy green sugar apples that look like they're going to be ripe. I don't really know if we're going to have enough to have fruit for sale, tropical fruit for sale, but they're all different sizes. And here's a chewy red sugar apple that produced fruit this year, produced fruit seed grown. 
Um, there's quite a bit of sugar apples on this particular trees through here. And some of them are getting big, like that one. Uh, I know our beach house uh, sugar apple, this is another, uh, I think it's a chewy red sugar apple. Um, I love the chewy sugar apples. I'm not a big fan of the mushy ones. My partner likes them all and he used to hate them. But since he's been eating so many of them, uh, he started liking them. And this is, of course, all ginger. Uh, Gallengall ginger. This is a, a longan. There's a longan. There's a custard apple over there. There's mangoes and bananas. And hopefully some cashews, which I don't really see. <clears throat> the, little banana, the little rabbits, you know. They... <laughs> They will always get your favorite plant, at least in my case, always. And um, I just had finally learned to just not let stuff like that bother me. Here's a little uh, sugar apple seedling. This is a, a Kizar mango. Kizar mango was my favorite mango. All These are all dry farmed, being grown in a holistic manner of a combination of, of various natural farming techniques. Uh, Korean natural farming, uh, Japanese natural farming, uh, zero budget natural farming, and then some regenerative agriculture methods. The oldest known regenerative farming method is biodynamic farming, which we are not biodynamic certified anymore, but I believe in their certification. It's a good way to teach you how to not how, but to guide you in the right direction on how to grow holistically and regeneratively. So if you can find biodynamic food, probably it's the closest thing you're going to get to clean, healthy food if you're not growing it yourself. And um, then I've combined permaculture, uh, indigenous farming and indigenous farming methods and the orchard floor pretty much is an indigenous farming method because uh, the Hopi Indians rely on what nature puts there to guide them on what to plant or if it will be a good spot to grow. And that's what I use it for, for guidance to see how healthy my system is. When the orchard floor is healthy and growing well, I know that my trees are going to grow well. This is a, uh, a Super Julie mango tree. So it's a combination of uh, regenerative farming methods to grow food, forest, fruit using a natural farming method that I put together to suit my needs. This is a, uh, a cacao seedling and it works. And here's a wild coffee tree, and right next to it, I planted a a uh, regular coffee tree. It was a gift from my friend Scott. <clears throat> Look at the chirichuelo and wind this video up. So here's the oil nut from Hindustan. It's what they got oil from to use on ship lanterns in place of kerosene and uh, it's amazing that it grows so well here. There's a Garcinia hombromiana, there's a Garcinia gardneri or a Garcinia brasiliensis. They have fruit on them, they're just little fruitlets. Right there. They fruit year round. This is a Garcinia gardneriana and that's a female uh, Garcinia hombromiana tree that probably is going to start flowering. This is a blue lily pilly from Australia. We have cedar bay cherries. I forgot to show those. I love cedar bay cherries. Uh, I thought they, I didn't care for them, but I really do. This is the purple forest guava. Uh, this is a little achachero. There's one of my cashews. That's what I mean. They're hard to see. <clears throat> They're hard to see popping up through the weeds. Weeds don't compete with them. They support them. Um, here's a, our, oh, beautiful. Look at this. Da, da, da. That wasn't planned. Look at that. This is the Chirichuela fruit. And they can get bigger than this, but I'm happy with this size fruit. And this fruit, this tree produces fruit year round. Um, 
that's kind of a tart. Um, lemon drop tasting. Uh, Garcinia. But. These sell for five for $97 at Miami Fruit. Got lots of seeds I always plant. Anyway, this is Florida Natural Farming. And this was how to grow food forest fruit naturally, doing natural farming methods from various forms of natural farming, like Japanese natural farming, Korean natural farming, zero budget, Indian zero budget natural farming, and creating Florida natural farming. And also in combination with regenerative farming methods like biodynamic farming, permaculture farming, centropic agroforestry. Anyway, I hope you have an excellent day and please try to take care of the planet and grow healthy food. Stay safe and healthy. Have an excellent day.